I think we're, we're ready to get started. And the first question, I think, a good place to begin, Denny, is the title of your book is How Good Writers Get Good. Can you define for us what you mean by good writer? It's more than just somebody who's good in competition. It's well, you know, I, I think that somebody who is really comfortable on the back of a moving horse, and it might be somebody that's never had a lesson in his life, her life. I mean, you know, I, I use an example of the little Indian kid in the Great Plains, you know, in 1840, who by the time he was eight or nine could swarm all over his pony and go galloping around, you know, with just a piece of rawhide in the pony's mouth <clears throat> and and was basically part of the horse. And I, I had a coach named Jack Legoff, and he was from Samur, the French National Riding Academy, and <laughs> he said um, he said that at some year they had sort of a mantra about what constituted a good rider, and he and his he had a little joke, and he said, you know, what are the three things that you have to have in order to be a good rider? One, a good seat. Two, a good seat. Three, a good seat. And um, and you're supposed to laugh. And <laughs> then um, and by that, what he meant was that you know, a horse when a horse moves, his back makes can. You know, he his back swings, and and a, and a rider who is really, really used to being on a horse's back, with or without stirrups, or even with or without a saddle, doesn't bounce. They're part they're part of the motion, and and I think that one of the things that probably differentiates the really good riders from thousands of people who ride is that you could take away the stirrups of a really good rider or take away the saddle and they would still be comfortable at the walk, trot, and canter on the back of a moving horse. So, it, you know, whether you're a Morgan rider, saddle seat rider, hunter, jumper, western, you know, are you comfortable on a moving horse? And to me, that probably is the, uh, pun, bottom line. And, and if you're not, you can acquire an independent seat, but you're going to have to work at it. And it's easier to do when you're 9 or 10 because you sort of effortlessly do it. You don't even realize it. It's like watching little kids ski. I live in Vermont, and you can see these little guys, you know, winging down the mountain, totally fearless, really elastic bodies. And I think it's so much easier to learn to do it, obviously, when you are young, but it doesn't mean you can't do it later. But it probably is going to be more work. That's yeah. a quick answer or maybe a long answer. It's a good answer, though. Okay, and then... Another question that I had, um, one of the things that you talk about, you, you discuss seven broad areas of choice in your book, How Good Writers Get Good. And one of the things that struck me, and I think we talked about this briefly when we were talking about the webinar, was that some of these areas, I don't think a person would naturally think that they could change or that they had a choice in. And one of those was that was the title of one of your chapters, I think. It was the body you choose to ride with. What are some of the choices that riders have with their bodies? And what everybody's looking at here, Denny, is a picture of you riding endurance. It looks like terrain looks sort of like the Tevis Cup. And maybe you could share with everybody um, how many years you've been riding and a little bit about the, di the diversity of your riding and then talk a little bit about um, the choices riders have so far as their bodies go. Yeah, well, I was lucky because when I was nine, uh, my parents moved uh, to Stonely Prospect Hill School. My father was headmaster there. <clears throat> and there was a barn, you know, like 20 seconds from our house. And so I started riding when I was 10. And mainly bareback, I'd come home from school, and I had a halter on the pony paint, and I'd just put a – I had a rope with a lead snap on each end, and I'd just get on and go. And so – I sort of got comfortable riding. This was about 1951, about 60 years ago, and I got comfortable and sort of in an effortless way. I, I didn't, I wasn't learning. I wasn't taking lessons. I was, I was learning just by doing. And um, and then I gravitated to Morgan's. There was a, the National Morgan Show. Well, yeah, I was right down the road in Northampton, and I. When, and when I was from the time I was about 12 or 13, I watched that for years. And I found a magazine in the in the library at Stonely about the 100-mile um, trail ride at GMHA, and I decided I wanted to do it. And I was 14, and I didn't know anything about trail riding, and I read some articles and started getting my horse fed. And 
a week after my 15th birthday, I finished my first 100-mile trail ride, um, and then I got a Morgan, and I rode in Morgan shows, the National Morgan Show, and I worked at the Green Mountain Stock Farm, which was the Lippitt Farm. And then I saw my first event in 1961, 50 years ago. That was the summer that I was about to turn 20, and um, decided that I wanted to do that and got involved in eventing and have done that for 50 years. And But I've done endurance riding. I, I did the Tevis Cup in 2004. I did half of it in 2003 in the Horse Got a Stone Bruise, then I completed in 2004. And I've done, you know, a lot of different sports. I've steeplechased and fox hunted and shown hunters and jumpers and dressage and a lot of the pieces of ridden saddle seat. So, um, and the body you choose to ride with, you know, one of the things that I find interesting is that you go to almost any sports program of any high school in America, even junior high, and you'll see the kids running. They'll probably have a weight room. They're very, very tuned in to getting them fit and agile and supple. And I've never been to a horse place where there was a weight room or where the kids were running or getting fit. And, you know, it's just axiomatic that if you're a fitter athlete, you're going to have more endurance, you're going to be more agile, more supple. And and I don't know why, you know, more people don't get it, that, you know, any other sport, you're going to be fitter and stronger. Why not in riding? Um, so right. that's... That's one piece. And, you know, part of that business of being able to sit on the back of a moving horse and staying still, I can remember something Sally Swift told me a long time ago. She said, think of a, think of a rider from the knees, she called it the stubby knees, to just under your short ribs. Picture that part, the, the pelvis and the thighs, you know, the, the thigh down to the knee. She said, that part belongs, you watch the good riders, that part belongs to the horse. And then the lower leg, and the upper body and the hands and the balance all belong to the rider. But if the middle of your body doesn't belong to the horse, then you bounce, <clears throat> and then your lower leg goes bangity-bang, and your hands jerk around, and now you don't have independent aids because you're not supple and with the motion. So I think that part of that is just getting used to it, and part of it is developing what they call push. I push myself. And... and uh, I'm, I'm no great hero about that. I don't mean it that way, but I I like to do this, and I know that my choices are to either stay fit as best I can or not be able to do what I like to do. So um, I think that's just a choice you have. Yeah, and um, an important one. A big one, yeah. Mm-hmm. Are you, I, there was a guy here named Walt Gervais. He rode in his first prelim three-day event when he was 75 years old. And he was still going training at 80. But he had been a boxing champion in the Navy in 1942, and he had been 25th in the Boston Marathon in 1946. He'd been an athlete for 60-something years. And he was my role model. And I can remember one time watching Walt pumping hay bales, and he's like 77, right? And he's lifting all these hay bales. And, and, he, and he said, you know, I don't like this. He said, you know, when you, when you see me doing all this, I'm not enjoying it, but I know I'm doing myself some good. And the minute he said that, it sort of resonated with me. You know what? It's a lot easier to sit and watch television than to go for a hike. It's a lot easier to just sit around than to lift hay bales or lift water buckets or sweep the barn aisle. But when you do those things, you're doing yourself some good. And that's what allowed Walt to be an elite athlete far, far beyond where most people have quit. Wow. That's powerful. Yeah, really powerful. <laughs> 